modern software regularly interacts with an API, a database, or a file. That means there's a lot of waiting, and you need to make sure that your software handles that efficiently. If you don't, your application is going to be much slower, and the more data you process, the more you interact with APIs, the worse this is going to get. The way to fix this is to rely on concurrency. In Python, you use the async IO package for that. I'll give you a brief overview of how the package works, but then I'd like to go a bit deeper and also show you how to turn a regular blocking function into something you can run concurrently, which could make your program a lot more efficient. And you don't even have to modify the original function for this. It's really easy. I'll also talk about how concurrency affects your software design and architecture. So make sure to watch this video till the end. If you want to learn more about how to design a piece of software from scratch, I have a free guide for you. You can get this at ariancodes.com slash design guide. Contains the seven steps I take when I design new software. Hopefully it helps you avoid some of the mistakes I made in the past. ariancodes.com slash design guide. And the link is also in the description of this video. You may have heard the terms concurrent and parallel computing before, but what's the difference? True parallel computing means that an application runs multiple tasks at the same time, where each task runs on a separate processing unit. Concurrency means that an application is making progress on more than one task at the same time, but may switch between these tasks instead of actually running them in parallel. If an application works, say, on tasks A and B, it doesn't have to finish A before starting B. It can do a little bit of A, then switch to doing a little bit of B, back again to A, and so on. This answer on Stack Overflow nicely illustrates the difference. Concurrency is two lines of customers ordering from a single cashier, and lines take turns ordering. Parallelism is two lines of customers ordering from two cashiers. Each line gets its own cashier. If you translate this back to computers, each cashier is a processing unit, a CPU core. Each customer is a task that the processor needs to take care of. Modern computers use a combination of parallelism and concurrency. Your CPU might have two, four, eight or more cores that can perform tasks in parallel. Your OS will run tens to hundreds of different tasks concurrently. A subset of those tasks are actually running in parallel while the OS seamlessly switches between the tasks. Parallelism in Python has a caveat, which is the global interpreter lock. Anytime you run Python code, it needs to acquire a lock on the interpreter. There are reasons for this that I won't go into in this video, but it effectively means that Python code is single-threaded, even if you stop multiple threads. There are ways around this, for example, by relying on multiple processes instead of multiple threads, or by switching to an interpreter that doesn't have to lock. This concerns parallelism, though. Concurrency, on the other hand, works really well in Python, especially since version 3.10. Why is concurrency a smart way to do computing? Well, it so happens that many tasks involve waiting. Our applications are waiting for files to be read or written to, they're constantly communicating with other services over the internet, or they're waiting for you to input your password or click a few buttons to help identify traffic lights in reCAPTCHA. I hate those things. It considerably speeds things up if a computer can do something else while waiting for that network response or for you to finish cursing about reCAPTCHAs. In other words, Concurrency is a crucial mechanism for making our computers work efficiently in this age of connectivity. The async I.O. package in Python gives you the tools to control how concurrency is handled within your application. As I've talked about in a previous video, the async and await syntax is the mechanism to achieve this. If you write async in front of a method or function, you indicate that it's allowed to run this method or function concurrently. A wait gives you control over the order that things are being executed in. If you write a wait in front of a concurrent statement, this means that the portion written below that statement can only be executed after the concurrent statement has completed. Being able to do this is important when the next part of your code relies on the result of the previous part. And this is often the case. You need to wait until you get the data back from the database or you need a confirmation from the API that your user is logged in in order to continue, and so on. I want to start with a quick recap of how concurrent programming in Python works. So for this, you need to use the async and await syntax. I have a simple example program here that retrieves Pokemon names. So I'm using a free API here to do this. 
So as you can see, here is a synchronous version of that code. It's a function get a random Pokemon name that picks an ID between one and the maximum Pokemon ID that's available. We have the URL and we construct it using this Pokemon ID. And then I'm using a function HTTP get sync. This is a function I made myself. I'm gonna explain later on how this works exactly. And then we return the name of the Pokemon as a string. Here we have an asynchronous version which does exactly the same thing, but uses HTTP get, which is another function that gets data yeah, using a get request. But this one works asynchronously. This one works concurrently. And it also returns the name. Currently, I'm using the non-concurrent version of this code. So this just gets a Pokemon name synchronously and then prints that name. And when you run this, then this is what you get. So we now get a nice Pokemon name randomly selected. Changing the code to use the concurrent version is really easy. In this case, what we need to do is we need to change main into an asynchronous function as well, like so. And now that we've made the main function asynchronous, we can add an await. And then, of course, I'm also going to have to remove the underscore sync here, like so. And now main is asynchronous. The only thing we still need to do is to make sure that main is run asynchronously and that's by using the asyncio.run function. There we go. And now if we run the code again, we should get exactly the same result, except of course now we get a Mew2, which is a different Pokemon. Now for the moment, there's not a big advantage in using concurrent programming here because we're just doing a single HTTP request, but Suppose you want to do multiple requests instead of only one. So the way you could do that is, for example, by running a for loop. So now we're running a for loop. Oh, I should remove this column here and put it there. So now we have for loop that retrieves a Pokemon name 20 times and prints out the name. And then this is what happens. It takes quite a while because every time we're launching a new request, we're waiting for that request to complete and then we call the next request. So this takes a few seconds. Now this is where you can really benefit from concurrent programming because why do we have to wait for every request to complete before we can send out the next request? Now obviously it's possible that the API that you're using has a rate limiting factor, so you can't send thousands of requests within a single second, but you can definitely batch things, so you don't have to wait every time. And this is where we can rely on the possibilities of async.io. So let me write an alternative to this for loop using async.io.gather. So what I'm now going to do is provide gather with a sequence of get Pokemon name calls. And I'm going to use a list comprehensive list and then unpack it. And let me use the same kind of for loop inside that list comprehension. So then this is what we get. And now we write a wait in front of it and then let's have a result. So now the result is going to be a tuple of strings and then we can print this as well, like so. So let me put this into comments, like so. And now let's run this program again. And as you can see, it's now much faster. Let's take a look at the time to see how much faster this actually is. So from time, I'm going to import the performance counter function. And then let's store the time before. And then let's print the total time in the synchronous case. And that's going to be performance counter minus the time before. There we go. And let's also do the same thing for the gather option. So I'm going to copy this line, paste it here. And I'm also going to copy this line and paste it here. And this is going to be the asynchronous version. So now if I run this code again, then this is what we get. So the synchronous version took over two seconds and the asynchronous version took 0.2 seconds. So that's a 10 times increase in efficiency. 
And all of that happens because we're just sending out the requests all at once instead of waiting for every request to complete. Async and await are actually pretty well integrated into Python, especially since 3.10. Let's take a look at a few things you can do with them. One thing you can do is combine the async and await syntax with generators. So for example, let me write a function that's called next Pokemon, which is going to give me the next Pokemon from a range of totals. So next Pokemon, this is getting one argument, which is a total. And then this is going to give me an async iterable object. And let's say that returns a string. We just want the Pokemon name. So what this does is we put a for loop in this that's going over the total. Rage, range, there we go. And the name is await get random Pokemon name. And then we're going to yield the name. So this is a generator. Now in the main loop, it's really easy to retrieve the next Pokemon names like so. And let's say we want the next 20 Pokemon and we're going to print the name. And let's just leave it like this. And now let's run the code and see what happens. So as you can see, asynchronous generators work, but it still calls these things in order. If you want a different behavior, you need to use gather like I showed you just before. Another thing you can do is create asynchronous list comprehensions and that works in exactly the same way. So instead of doing this for loop here, what you then do is names equals, and then we're going to create a list comprehension name async for name in next Pokemon 20. And then let's also print the names like so. And now when we run this code, as you can see, we get more or less the same timing. So it's still doing these in sequence, but now we have them in a list. And again, as I said, if you want different behavior, use gather and that's going to run them concurrently. Another thing I'd like to show you now is how to turn non asynchronous code blocking code into code that you can run concurrently. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, give it a like, and let me know if this is helpful to you in the comments. So I have here another example, which has a couple of functions in there. There is an asynchronous counter function that starts a counter and then goes to a range. There is a sleep function call. So this simply tells the uh, interpreter to, to wait. In, in other words, you can run other tasks concurrently and then it prints out was asleep for a number of milliseconds. There's also a send request call that sends some HTTP request to a URL and returns the status code. And my main function, which is an asynchronous function, then sends that request to ariancodes.com, which is my website, and we get an HTTP re response with the status code, and then it awaits the counter. So if I run this, then this is what happens. We get the HTTP request, status 200. After we get the response, we start the counter. Now, what should you do in order to make these things run concurrently? Problem is that send request is not concurrent code at the moment, it's blocking. So one way you might think you could fix this is by using the async IO create task function. So we already create the task. That's create task. And we're going to provide it the call to the counter function. And then instead of awaiting the counter here, we're just going to await the task here. And then maybe it already starts the task and does this at the same time, right? So let's try this and see what happens. So as you can see, it didn't change anything. We still first have to wait until we get the HTTP response and then we start the counter. So that was not the solution. Another thing you might want to try to do is to use asyncio.gather like we saw before, but that also doesn't work because send request is not concurrent. It's not asynchronous. What we actually need to do in order to solve this is to turn send request into an asynchronous function. And there's a very simple way to do this with asyncio. And for that, we're going to use the to thread function. So let me create another function here, async send async request. So this is going to be a wrapper around the synchronous send request function. So this is getting a URL and this returns an int. In this function, we're going to return async io dot to thread, which is the function that we're going to use to turn send request into an asynchronous function. 
So I'm going to provide to thread with the send request function. And we're going to pass the URL as an argument to the to thread function as well. So it passes it along to the synchronous function. What this does is that it creates a separate thread in which to run that particular blocking task. In this case, the call to the send request function. And then you can use it as part of a concurrent program. So then here we're going to call the send async request. So we put an await in front of that. And now we've turned this into an asynchronous program. One thing I forgot is that we also need to write await in front of this because we're awaiting the to thread function. So now when I run this code again, you see that we start the counter, we send the HTTP request and we're doing these things concurrently. So that works now. And now because we have two asynchronous functions, we can also use gather again to do the same thing. So instead of writing this, I could also write something like this. So we're gathering the two function calls and awaiting their result. The second one counter doesn't return anything. So I'm simply putting an underscore here. And then when I run this, we get exactly the same result. When I started explaining the Pokemon example, I used an HTTP get and an HTTP get function that I said I coded up myself. So what does it look like? Well, that's in this module. And these functions are actually really simple. So I'm using the requests package to do HTTP requests. So I have a synchronous version here that calls the get function of the request package and then returns the response as a JSON object. And I have an asynchronous version that uses asyncio.toThread that calls this function, but then turns it into something that you can run concurrently. So as you can see, this is really easy to use, really easy to set up. You can use this kind of approach whenever you need to interact with an API and it's going to help you make your code run much more efficiently because you can group API calls, which will save you a lot of time waiting for the result. If you don't want to write asynchronous code for doing these kinds of API requests, you can also use another package for that. That's called IOHTTP, which I'm using here in this particular example. So here I have an alternative of the HTTP get function that uses IOHTTP, creates a session, and then the session has a get function that you can call and then it returns a response as a JSON value, just what you see here. You also see an example of using async with a context manager, which is also possible. So in this case, creating the session is asynchronous and the get method is also a context manager that you can run concurrently using the with statement here. I have a confession to make. I don't really like these nested with statements. So unless you really need to use the session for some reason, if you just want to do a simple get request, just use the to thread function to do it in the way that I just showed you. It's much simpler. How does concurrent programming change the way design patterns work? In principle, not at all. Due to the very clean await async syntax, there is no effect of coupling or cohesion by introducing asynchronous code into your application. For example, if you want to use the strategy pattern, you can create an asynchronous method in your strategy class and then call that and await it. If you want to use the factory asynchronously, no problem. Create objects asynchronously if you want to. The basic pattern doesn't change just parts of the pattern become awaitable. On the architectural level, concurrent programming might have some impact depending on what you do. You can imagine that if you're processing data in a pipeline that relies on asynchronous operations, which is quite common, you'd want to adapt the data structure so that it allows you to specify what to run concurrently versus what to run in a sequence. I gave an example of this in a previous video where I showed you how you can create a nested structure of sequential and concurrent function calls. If you'd like me to go into more detail on this in another video, let me know in the comments below. As you can see, there are lots of ways you can use concurrent code in Python to write more efficient programs. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like consider subscribing to my channel if you want to learn more about software design and development. Thanks for watching, take care and see you soon.